I wanted to um, uh, follow on from what Chris had said uh, with an experience that I had when I was nine. So I was growing up in, in Canada and uh, central British Columbia, and I was nine years old and I was about to turn 10. And being a really nerdy kid, I thought, wow, that's a big deal. It's like in an automobile, old-fashioned automobiles had these things called odometers, which actually wheels that turned around and actually brought the numbers up. And I used to study those, like, whoa, that they're rolling around. It was like a chrono chronometer of, of reality. And uh, so I thought, well, I'm going to go to 9 to 10. That's two digits, one digit to two digits. And that's a big deal because I won't get to three digits for a long time. 99 more years or 80, 89 more years. So I thought, what do I do? So I went out into to hike. Perfect. I went out for a little hike uh, near the river where I was where I was a kid, where I was a nine-year-old kid. And I thought, what do I do as a nine-year-old kid to talk to my future? Because when you're nine, you don't know that you shouldn't be able to talk to your future. So I thought, hi. Ah, I, what I'll do is I'll speak to it. I'll speak to all of the future selves. And I saw them. Suddenly, boom, there was this lineup of future selves and sort of faded bass relief going all the way down. And they were doing cool things. Like, oh, there's me in my teens, and there, there's the 20s, and there's a such, such and such, and they, they got a little more faded. But I thought, they're doing cool things. That's great. So I looked, started to look forward to life, that the future selves were doing cool things. And then I thought, what do I do to assure myself that I don't screw up the system? Right now, it's a pure system. It's just pure intention ho and, and hope. And it ca I came up with it, which is, I that's the ticket. Now, this is before the that's the ticket thing, but uh, that's the ticket. I'll give them an agreement, some kind of agreement that if they all agree to it, it'll guarantee a better future. And I thought, well, what, what should that agreement be? Ah. <sighs> it'll be that they should never send negative thoughts back through time to the previous little or self because the little or self was doing the best it knew how to do. So if I don't have that coming down, things will be better. So I literally kind of hand wrote this agreement on a virtual piece of paper and passed it out to them and they just picked it up one after the other, kind of like a hall of mirrors. And they all like agreed to it. You know, they agreed to it. And then suddenly it was like a whoosh happened. Like, whoa. There's no negative thoughts coming back anymore. It's guaranteed by contract, <laughs> by contractual agreement. Every time one of them is like, I screwed up, and they stop that thinking because, oh, I made the agreement. I can't have that. You know, the, I screwed up bad. The previous self was everything. So everything went forward. All the doors went open, 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 open. And it's been that way ever since. And the second, the second part of that was then I thought, well, then stuff comes to you through this channel because it's now open, and it's intuition. And I didn't know what to call it, but I knew from that moment when I started to walk, I said, I'm going to be walked not by my head, but by what intuition tells me to do. And not some kind of a fantasy thing. Literally move me. You know, like, oh, don't go to that area because there's probably kids that are going to beat me up, but I didn't know about it. Uh, go around here, and then I met somebody. And I kept, I've done that ever since. So it's like, that's how I roll. That's how I, I do things from that point. So it kind of works. And in meditation and calming the monkey mind, you can actually see those clear paths in the future and the messages coming back. And this work, uh, what I'm going to describe to you tonight, is a result of that lifetime of work. Uh, so when I was 14, I was walking out, and these are the hills uh, near where I was raised in central British Columbia, sagebrush hills. I just loved them. And so I was 14 years old, and it was the springtime, and there was a mariposa lily coming up through the frozen ground. And I knelt down to look at it. It was my favorite flower. And I thought to myself, how did this complex geometry come from a simpler thing underground that wasn't so complex, a bulb or a seed or something, just a little capsule? And then I stood up and thought, that's a really interesting question. But that question could be asked for any of the plants. And then my little time-traveling mind went back, searching back, because it basically asked the question, there must have been a first seed 
for all these plants. And I groped back through time looking for it. And then I remembered reading a, a TV show about Albert Einstein where he did thought experiments. When he was 16, you know, he was a total thought experiment junkie. And he was had one where he was riding alongside a beam of light. I think he closed his eyes and just became this traveler and watched the compression waves on the beam of light. And that led to a special relativity. I thought, well, that's how you do science. You just kind of open your system, pose a question, and uh, wait for a delivered thing. Who knows where it comes from? And I did the same thing. I was walking up back up the hill, and then this, uh, in my mind's eye, this is what came in to my view. And I was like, oh, it's my first thought experiment right on schedule, because I had posed the question, how did small molecules come together to assemble into a machine that could make other molecules, like, you know, without a creator, without a really master chemist, a very patient chemist, moving carbon atoms around five angstroms to the left and things like this. How did, how did this happen on the early Earth, you know? You know, because if you pour a bunch of Lego blocks out or Meccano or Tinker Toy and just, it, it doesn't self-assemble and do things, not even simple things, right? How on Earth, you know, with these simple molecules? And so in my mind's eye came this, my first thought experiment. And the molecules were all packed together and they were moving. They were conforming and linking and whatnot. I didn't know much chemistry. I just knew that molecules were these blobs, you know, sticks and balls and things. But this is sort of a blobby thing. And I was about to ask it the question. I thought, well, what do you do when you get a thought experiment? You, maybe you ask it a question. So I was about to ask it the question, how did you get together and do this thing? And it, then it asked me the question, figure out how we made a copy of ourselves figure out how we made a copy of ourselves. And my little little 14-year-old brain went flash and it saw an automobile factory making automobiles. And I said to the blob of this blob, well, automobiles are made in huge machines called automobile factories and I don't see a big machine around you, you know. So this is implausible, how make a copy of you. And it winked at me, it said, go figure it out. And 40 years later, there's me at uh, 54 instead of 14 at Bumpus Hell in Mount Lassen National Park, actually on camera for a documentary, uh, putting a slide tray into a funeral event to figure this thing out. And we'll get back to what happened uh, uh, as a result of that. So there's the funeral event. It's not an advisable place to be standing, by the way. <laughs> so... Who first tried to figure this out? Well, the Greeks had their ideas on biogenesis, and you know this is one of the oldest questions in human history. This man really went the farthest to figure out the origin of life, and we know him for his origin of species. But this was this was a phenomenal mind, despite his frequent bouts of maudlin and depression and whatnot, and and his conflicts in Victorian England. This man's genius really kind of knew no bounds. And in a letter to his friend T.J. Hooker in 1871, this is what he wrote, you know, but if, and what a big if, we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, etc., present that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. He actually nailed it. This is it. This is the fundamental insight that now, after decades, our field is coming back to. So our field uh, kind of got kicked off in the 1920s with Haldane and Oparin in their chemical soups idea that somehow you had to get the right things together they would somehow react. And it was this sort of a pri primordial or primal soup uh, s concept. And it was all well and good. Uh, but they're, basically their, their approach was more complex organic, organic compounds have to start from simpler precursors. Yes, yes. They, you don't get the complex compounds without simpler precursors. Then we had Miller and Urey in 1953 with their famous spark chamber experiment where they made dozens of amino acids out of a reducing atmosphere by sparking it. And this actually launched our field. This was an international sensation. This was at the time of Watson and Crick and DNA and early 1950s. This was the huge 
a huge international phenomenon on this. Um, in 1977, there was a discovery of deep sea hydrothermal vents by Alvin, the, the submersible Alvin. And for a time, so this was suggested by Corliss in 1982 that perhaps life could have started at these vents because you have sources of chemical energy, you have uh, compounds and things like this, and the field has actually been down this rabbit hole for 30 years because the chemists never have liked this much. Because if you make a compound, if any of you are in chemistry, if you make a compound, especially a polymer, and you leave it in solution, what happens to it? It hydrolyzes, it breaks up. So if, if you are able to make a compound deep, deep sea vent environment, where it's probably going to dissipate into the cold bulk, but it's just going to hydrolyze. And the, the chemists could never figure out how are we going to actually grow polymers in this environment. We just can't do it. So this sat for decades. Uh, a lot of investment was, was made in this chemical batteries and things like that. A lot of good science was done, but it didn't have anything to do with the origin of life. So the field is now, uh, in the last two years, has shifted its focus back to land-based pools where Darwin had his original insight. So in order to do this work like Darwin, uh, in a little bit more comfort, David Deemer, my colleague at UC Santa Cruz, and I took a wonderful tour in 2015 called the Astrobiology Grand Tour. The next one starts in July, by the way. And literally... Our colleagues at University of New South Wales took us on this route from Perth up to Shark Bay and then through Tom Price and up into this area called the Pilbara, which is the oldest, largest intact piece of Earth's crust from the Archean period, 3.5 billion year old crust has survived this ship, has been pushed around and put in various continents and actually has maintained an intact uh, form capped by lava, and it's an amazing t journey through time. So, for example, we go to Shark Bay. This is a, an amazing saline estuary that has uh, the largest uh, conglomeration of stromatolites. You'll see those in a minute. These are stromatolites. These are the most common macrostructures in the history of life on Earth, and they're basically biofilms growing on top of each other, sequestering sand grains, and they grow these rock towers. People thought they were, were they were geological for the longest time, but they're made by biology, stromatolites, and they leave clear imprints in the fossil record. Here's me standing amongst the stromatolites. Now, these are recent stromatolites. These aren't the stromatolites of 3.5 or 4 billion years ago, but it wouldn't have looked much different. Uh, the sky would have been probably orange or pink back then. So I bent down to to test the top of the stromatolite and, and found that it has a sponginess to it. And this will come, we'll come back to this later. This was a clue about the origin of life. So we then drove our, our bus inland with our group, and this is stromatolites at 2.6 billion years old. And I actually have one of them right here. So I'll just hold it up. If, if you'd like, I can pass it around. You can just, as I'm talking about this. So the, the, the little striations there, the layering, that's biofilm sequestering sand grains and cementing them, and then they grow up, and they grow the tower, they grow the structure. This is a lakeshore stromatolite. This is about 3 billion years of age. This is your common ancestor. This is the common ancestor of all life on Earth, long before plants and animals. And this is 90% of the story of life on Earth is microbial mat communities. And 90% of the volume, the mass of life on Earth is microbial mat communities. And complex life, probably is 2 to 4% of the history of the Earth, Earth life will be 2 to 4%, a little bump. And it'll go back to these guys until our planet's consumed in the heat death of the sun. So the, this, is, this is life in the cosmos, the majority of it. So pass that around. It's very heavy, too. You'll feel the heft of this thing because it's just full of infused iron. And this is an, an anoxic environment that life is gradually oxidizing the iron out of the water systems and the atmosphere and dropping it down. To, because life had to do that in order to create a buffer to allow oxygen to, to get give us an oxygenated atmosphere. That took three billion years of non-stop work by microbial communities. 
So stromatolites. So here's another view of domical stromatolites seen from the top. This is more of a, a lakeshore stromatolite. And here's stromatolite in between layers of black chert, which if you thin section them, one in 10,000 thin sections, you'll see a microfossil, individual cellular microfossil. And this is very controversial in our field for the last 20 years, but these you can actually find extant single-cell organisms uh, within black chert that's of the same age as, as the stromatolites. So here we are at the uh, famous Buick locality. And there I'm looking through a loop at, at these textures. There's David Diemer on the right and myself on the left at the Strelly Pool Formation, which is the discovery outcrop for, this, for these Archean stromatolites. And there it is. It's the famous Strelly Pool uh, stromatolites, 3.46 billion years old. So what has happened in the last four or five years is a revolution in the understanding of the geological evidence for life on land, which is that the entire Pilbara was thought originally to be a seashore environment where you find a lot of marine stromatolites, those big towers. But they've reconsidered this now as a lake, as a caldera with a lake in it, and that it was ringed by hot springs, hot springs. And the reason that they, this is pretty conclusive, is they found geyserite. This is geyserite. These black and light titanium layers are a, a, a mineral that's made by splattering water coming out of geyser, like at Yellowstone. And this is conclusive. And geyserite, this particular geyserite, was preserving what were, are considered to be preserved air bubbles, just like you see air bubbles in the mucus material that holds bacterial communities together. This is the oldest evidence for metabolism on the Earth. Oxygen bubbles at 3.5 billion years ago leaving, and these are the, the terra set uh, fabrics from, uh, basically if you go to Yellowstone, you can find this being made every day today in, in, in the centers at Yellowstone. So if we put the rock record together, and this is sort of a backwards way because most of the chemistry community starts with chemistry. And the reason the chemistry com community has not cracked the mystery of the origin of life is because it's a field run by solution chemists. A solution chemist is someone who takes a reaction in solution, does it for a while until it winds down and uses up all the products, and then they disanalyze it. That life is, doesn't work that way. Life goes away from equilibrium, not down to it. Life continually bubbles up and makes more complexity. So if you're studying the origin of life from an unwinding reaction, you're never going to find a path forward. Now, I'll, I'll show you how we found the path forward. But by going to the geology, the geological record, which most origin of life chemists were not looking at, we can see some continuity. So at 3.5 billion years ago, you have hot springs crammed with mi microbial communities. You then, this is another sample I found last year at the Dresser Formation, subsurface vein uh, barite preserved uh, stromatolite. This is the lakeshore stromatolite that's about 800 million years younger. And there's our modern stromatolites. So if you, if you look at the reverse of the rock record, you've got in, incredibly developed living systems inland at hot springs, not in an ocean environment. So this is suggestive of an origin in the hot spring setting. So here's the model. So we've got the early Earth. We've got large oceans. We have volcanic land masses. And you'd have various aqueous settings. You'd have, you know, endolithic environments where you're collecting stuff from the atmosphere. And this is very important because you need to collect and concentrate in order to have chemistry happen. In the ocean, if meteoritic material is falling in the ocean, it just dilutes. You need little ponds. You just like in a test tube here downstairs, you've got to concentrate things enough so they get together to, to react. In this particular environment, perhaps there is what Pounder and Sutherland called the Goldilocks chemistry. You know, the Goldilocks zones around planets where the, it's an ideal place for life to, to emerge. They proposed a Goldilocks chemistry. Well, with thousands of these pools on land, surely one of them is going to have the right conditions, the right temperature, the right feeding, the right concentration to do the, the chemistry you need. But then there's a natural downhill flow toward more extreme environments, one of them being rivers, very dilute. Right, a pond driven by hydrothermal 
pool full of energy and the same things that come out of vents in the oceans. But a lake and a river are very, very dilute. So if you go to a stream in Yellowstone Park, one that's coming out of a hot spring, it's full of life. If you go to a regular river, it's got almost no life in it at all because it's very dilute. There's nothing to eat. When you hit the ocean in environment, you have high salts and you have high tides and you have divalent cations and dissolved iron. Really tough environment for any chemistry to work that's prebiotic. So by the time you get to the ocean, you have a tough living organism. So this is optimal. We consider these land-based environments to be optimal, and the seashore is extreme. It's an extremophile environment. So in the land, you have this ability to collect material falling in, concentrate it, cycle it, and then subject whatever comes out of your cycle to adaptation and stress it. And you ne always need stress gradients to evolve the living world. That's how natural selection works. So in a sense, uh, early life on Earth would have gone undergone a downhill distribution, but at the same time an uphill evolutionary gradient driven just by natural flows. This also would go for life on Mars, and we'll talk about that in a bit. So here's a uh, actual uh, Goldilocks little warm little pool. This is in Kamchatka in Russia. This is Dave Deemer's hand pointing down to the pool where he went 15 years ago and literally poured the chemicals into this pool and immediately saw that the pool was subject to these, these cycling events and that if he poured his compounds in the pool, he saw membranous structures emerge immediately on the surface of the pool. And this was the first time that someone actually went to a hydrothermal environment and tried the chemistry. You know, this is, these are complex environments. These are messy environments. And the feedstock would come from things like this, the Murchison meteorite, a carbonaceous chondrite that the same age as the Earth. This is the feedstock source. These, these guys are full of amino acids, nucleobases, and fatty acids. So all the chemical compounds you need are, are in the solar system, in the dusty early disk of the solar system. So back in the lab, in sort of cleaner conditions, we built this machine which hydrates these vials on one side and dehydrates them on the other side. So we can set this to rotate in four-hour cycles or one-hour cycles, and we can dehydrate solutions down. So we, we put in CO2 dehydration. This is an anoxic chamber. We can rehydrate. And what, what we expected to happen, and which did, was in the presence of lipids, so this is a lipid bilayer here, our monomers, and these in this case is AMP and, and UMP, the building blocks of RNA, get squeezed down. So as, as this dish uh, dehydrates down, think of it, it's like a bathtub ring forms. If you put soap in a bathtub and, and then drain it and dry it down, you get a bathtub ring, right? They're hard to clean off because there's layers. There's, there's thousands of layers. That's why you, to buy special things to scrub a bathtub ring. Those bathtub rings are chemical factories. They can do things because they squeeze the water out. So as water is drying down, those layers, uh, the water leaves. And as you know from your chemistry, if water is a leaving group, you can form an ester bond. This is the only way nature would have had to make biopolymers is dehydration. In fact, your body, as you walk around the street, you're using something called ATP to kick water molecules out of the way so that you can form bonds for your your proteins and your RNA and DNA. So life is a system that learned how to dehydrate on its own without having to dehydrate. <clears throat> but pre-life or proto-life had to use natural drying cycles in order to build its, its connections because there's no enzymes. There's no active thing making ATP that kicks the water out. That, that comes later. So it's the only plausible way that Mother Nature had to get us going was drying down solutions and then refilling them. So the way we, we proved to ourselves and our colleagues that this was happening is this is uh, the, the addition of these two building blocks, and this is cycles, and this is our product here. And we're getting up to, you know, plus 100 mer, so that one, three, five, seven cycles, and we're getting over 100 mer lengths of RNA. We're growing RNA just by drying the dishes down and rehydrate them, dry them down, rehydrate them. We've created a, a pump. And this is the technology that Dave invented in the 1980s. It's, it's called the nanopore technology. And we use the minion, which they have one downstairs in, in their lab here, 
uh, to actually run our putative RNA through this pore in a membrane, and it counts the bases as they go through. These are called blockades, and there's a current interruption, and it, it allows you to actually sequence one base at a time. And so this works with our own technology that, that came out of our lab. So we're doing from 40 to 150 mer length RNA, and our colleagues are now doing peptide synthesis, huge libraries of peptides through dehydration. A total revolution in solution chemistry, right? Would you do everything in solution? Dry it down, see what happens. This is like a giant revelation for, for our branch of chemistry. So back to Bumpus Hell, you remember the original picture. Uh, this is what we did there, and this was two years ago. So we're using AMP and UMP, phosphatidylcholine, you know, on these rock samples. And we had been foolish enough not to consult a, a, a volcanologist about using hydrothermal vent glasses. And they said, if, they, they, if we had, they would have said, it's so humid it'll wash all your slide trays clean, which it did. So we went all the way to Bumpus Hill, put our slide trays into a pipe, jammed the pipe down into a 90 Celsius fumarole vent. The gases came up, cooled down, created a rain wash event, and washed out the slides. And we pulled them out on camera for this documentary and turned them upside down. They were just, we just lost all our reagents. It's all gone. It's so embarrassing. So at the last minute, Dave said, okay, go collect samples. So I collected these rock samples. We split them in half. We put them in the slide tray. I wrapped this, this cage around them because you can't cover the gases coming out. It'll just rain on them. And the, the wafting of the gas alone on our reagents were on this one molar sulfuric acid surface of lipid and AMP and UMP, we got an, an RNA-like polymer. We were able to polymerize with vent high gas at humidity. <clears throat> Pretty crazy. Uh, so not a pond, but a vent, vent gas. This is hydrating and dehydrating. So I went to Yellowstone. So our geologist colleagues were challenging us and saying, your system will never work in, in the alkaline conditions of high silica. Uh, because it'll precipitate your organics. And then the other geologist is saying, well, your system will never work in, in the acid environment with clays because it'll adsorb the organics. So I said, you're probably right. We're probably completely, you just falsified everything we're working on, but I'm going to go try this. So I went with the field season, and this is one of the springs we used. And this had, um, this is a this is an alkaline, about pH 7, 8, no, 8, 8.5. And You'll notice these little ridges there. That's because this erupts about every 90 minutes. And then the central cone drops, and all of the outflow channel, which you can see here, dries down. And then as it dries down, this, this goopy, gelatinous material forms, and that's silica forming into a gel just before it becomes sinter, mineral. It's, and it's showing us hydration and dehydration happening, these layers. And if you look at the outflow channel, this is all chemical eaters here. And then as you get further down, you get cooler temperatures and you get photosynthetic organisms. This pattern, this very interesting pattern. So there's further down, that's all sunlight eaters in the hot water. It's not hot enough. And then just a little, a, f a, f a, f a foot or two away is all this material that is just crumbly center, crammed with endoliths, crammed with green photosynthetic bacteria. This whole mound is a living thing. It's an amazing place to go to study these things. So I literally put these batteries of uh, alkaline and, and acid you know, waters with our lipid, with our little dried up acid ring, shook them up, and you can see there's a milky thing. This is actually vesicles forming. And we took them back to the lab, and they encapsulated RNA and DNA. The same, the, the, the waters from Yellowstone were able to do it for both, at, at both levels. We were able to do this thing. So then I sent this paper off to the geologist who was biting my head off at a meeting, and he said he read it three times at five in the morning and said, wow, you've added new stuff to our field. We never thought this would ever happen. But nobody went out in the field and tried it. And so this is, this is how we're putting the polymers into the compartments. And this is staining that shows that we're encapsulating these polymers in these bubbles by the trillions. So this is the lipid we used, the monomers, this is our stain, and it worked in both. And then we went, for, for fun, we went down to the ocean in Santa Cruz 
took some seawater, filtered it down, and it crystallized all these, all of this uh, lipid. There's no way in the ocean you could have made lipid protocells, period, end of story. The ocean is way too harsh an environment for life to be in. Just, it can't, unless someone can show us how. So here's my second thought experiment. And I'm, I was raised not as in chemistry, but as a computer nerd. I was a computer nerd. Before there were computers in our town, I was, I was writing programs on sheets of paper and running them in my head because I was frustrated that there were no computers, but at least I could simulate a computer in my brain. And by the time we got the first microcomputer in our town, I was like, this thing sucks, you know, because I'd come up with a model for a computer that would have trillions of tiny little processors that would come into existence for certain tasks and go away. And I thought, there's only one processor? And it has this great big instruction set? This thing will break. And it was like, computers suck, you know, Maybe we'll build the ultimate computer someday, but that, that was what I was doing as a kid. But if you know about vintage computers, they were programmed with paper tapes. You remember, does anybody remember paper tapes and punch cards? So consider, so when I was working on this problem of the origin of life, I thought, well, okay, normally you've got an engineer who will punch a paper tape and make a program, and that program will either run or it won't. And... How could you evolve computers from a completely random starting point? No gods, no engineers. So I came up with this model, a random tape puncher that had an infinite supply of tape, and it could just completely punch random programmers, programs in random lengths that would then go into a reader, into a, you know, this is an Altair 8800. I have a collection of these things in my barn if you want to come see them. Uh, into this box called a computer with a source of energy, and a thing called a multiprocessor, or a microprocessor, which runs these random tapes, and they either crash, and they go to the crash trash, or they you can play them again. So if they actually light up some lights and do something, you can you call it a program. It did something. It lit a light up. Well, we'll go and make some more of it. So we program A, which worked, gets tried, gets appended to program B, C, and D, which are also random, and we try those and it evolves into a more complex computer because the program is going to do more than the program maybe generates the hardware, et cetera, et cetera. This is a, a nerd metaphor for the booting up of the living world. And what if programs A and C are, they're pretty functional, so that, that'll add a laptop screen. Program F adds the laptop screen. And if we keep going, we get the smartphone. So it's a metaphor for the co-evolution of software and hardware together through random selection, through lots of cycling, and lots of selection. You know, the key thing is this, this selection step to get you there. So this is a very inefficient way of making technology, but it's possible, it's plausible. So where do you find this in nature? What if we just fade that into the background? Let's look for it in the natural setting. Well, you've got organics, they're building blocks. Basically, your punch paper tape are coming in from the solar system. At 4.5, 4.4, 4.3 billion years ago, you have a dusty disk in the solar system, and the planet is sweeping it. And you've got trillions of tons of material falling in, like almost like snow, onto the early Earth. Huge feedstocks of material, lots of hydrothermal pools, lakes, streams, a huge ocean, um, cycling climate, etc. And the building blocks, the fatty acids coming in from space, forming our little little membranes, our little bathtub rings, and that makes our polymers, our little random programs. So let's see what happens to those. It's called a polymer, a random program. It goes into our simple computer called a warm little cycling pool that runs it. And here's our Charlie Darwin here saying, okay, we've got that. We've got our energy source. We have our phosphoric salts. We have our et cetera. And we have a, a, a protein compound here. Let's see if we can make it longer. And because they're trapped in protocells, those are the programs. So you have the punch paper tape and you have a random collection of those little polymers. It's a program. And they either crash, say become unstable and fall apart, or they go forward. Same process. So we decided to try this. So this is the evolution of software and hardware together, but chemically. It's a plausible metaphor. So to crack the final, the final part of uh, 
this problem, I realized I was missing a piece. And let's go back to Gallery Hill. And here's the greatest thought experiment of the last few years on this whole thing. So this Gallery Hill in Northwest Australia, part of our tour, it's 160 degrees in the summer on the ground there. So you don't want to go there during the Australian summer. But it's the largest collection of petroglyphs on the planet. 80,000 years of, of aboriginal petroglyphs, including star maps, large kangaroos, rainbow serpents, all over this. It, it, there's, it, this isn't the mound itself, but it's, an, it's called Gallery Hill because it's covered with petroglyphs. And while walking at Gallery Hill, I discovered these. What are these shoe leather-like things? And Martin Van Cranendonk, who's our, the chief geologist, said, these are microbial mats. These are desert mats. They're, he said they're kind of like the ones we saw at Shark Bay, but they're dried out. And I thought to myself, this is like, it's on the edge of a rock surface, and water had been running down there, and then the, these dried out, but they're, and he said, yeah, they're still alive, but they're desiccated. They're waiting for the next wet cycle, and that could be years in, in these kind of desert conditions. So what I did was I said, I'm going to simulate rainfall. So I took out my water bottle, and I poured water down the rock face to sort of liquefy that mass. And then I touched it, and it was coming alive just right then and there. It was, these are active biofilm communities, and it felt just like the, the uh, stromatolites at Shark Bay, the sponginess. Oh, then I stood up and had the greatest epiphany in this whole thing. I said wait a minute, the common ancestor was not an individual's protocell. It was a community structure. And the common ancestor of this unit is another simpler community. There was never a common ancestor that was an individual. It was a community. It was a network. That was the greatest insight. And I realized that somewhere inland, connected to it, was a hot spring where this protocell mass could get started. And this is a huge thing that rolls in even into philosophy, and I'll get to that later. So let's put it all together. This is our famous three-phase cycle. I added this third phase, so not just wet and dry, but there's something in between wet and dry. So when you're drying a bathtub down or a dish down, you have a moist phase. You have a phase in which the sludge or the bubbles, the protocells are sitting at the bottom of the dish, and they're moist. That ma matters. That's the phase where life can begin, actually. It's in between wet and dry. And the way it would work is the following. You have your dry films. Remember, they make your polymers. They get put into random protocells. They get tested for stability. The ones that are stable survive, and they collect as a mass in the bottom of the dishes. And this is exactly what we see in the lab. So let's take a look. So there's our dry phase. There's a freeze fracture showing all these layers of lipid. There's the encapsulation of the polymers. There's the testing for stability. Some of them wobble apart. Here's the delivery of surviving protocells into this gel. We call this a gel because it's a hydrogel. There's a, a micrograph of that. And then this microgel fuses back together these things get flattened out, they fuse back together, and whatever polymers they're carrying, they're like passengers on airplanes. They just dump out into the terminal, and they go back into these layers. And they can get templated and then amplified through this cycle and get longer and longer and get selected for. It's a system of natural selection in cycling pools. So what we found, and after having this insight, I called Dave, I wrote him a long email and called him, and he said, you found it. You found the kinetic trap. And that's a chemist's way of saying that the rate of synthesis is exceeding the rate of hydrolysis. So these are getting longer. And this is exactly what we see in the lab. In cycle one, there's 20 mers, and then there's 50 mers, and 70 mers, and 120 mers, growing, 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 just like your body does every day. So here is the grand thought experiment number four of putting it all together. Let's put the... the astrocosmochemistry together with, by the way, can we turn these lights down so you can we can see it? It's just right behind that pillar there. Oh, it'll be much better. I just noticed. This would be one more. You can turn that one off. Turn those down. You'll be able to see this much more clearly. It's just these ones. Ah, is that better? 
Okay, sorry about that. So here it all is, and this was what was, pro we produced this for our colleagues, as this is what Scientific American picked up in their article last August, which I'll show you in a second. So we called this, we just named it, the hot spring origin of life, and it starts out with synthesis of, of many of the organic building blocks in the solar system. There's a, and, and Kepler's now actually seeing many of these solar systems in formation, and there's missions flying, but they can actually be able to see the shadows cast across the disk by planets being formed. Tremendous stuff. And so that's, that's your feedstock coming in. It will accumulate in pools. So here's our first little organics accumulating in the, in the, in our first pool. Say maybe we, we depicted this caldera as a concentrating and sharing mechanism. So then you get enough concentration in these pools that you get various, what Martin Van Cranen calls pools of fitness where different chemical products are produced and mixed. So we have sufficient concentration for that. And then we have delivery of these products into an ideal cycling environment. This is our genesis engine. This is our machine, our wheel of creation, if you will, that will now rotate and turn simple membranous protocellular polymeric things into a system that evolves, that evolves function out of random sequences. Then we have the transition to the living world somewhere in there. And the unit that you're actually growing every time is, is this gel, which we use the term progenote. And this is Carl Woese and George Fox's term from their 1977 paper. The progenote is the unit it's, it's the form that's in booting up toward the living system where genotype and phenotype are emerging. And they described this in their 1977 paper. And I went to see George Fox two years ago in the University of Houston, showed him this model, and he said, you have found it. You, you've come closest to what um, Carl and I predicted for the progenote. Uh, so I started using their term with permission. So then you have this this phase of distribution. So you imagine this sludge here. These are pools full of little sludges that can grow and shrink and, and respond. They have really short little, you know, genetic-like sequences. They have short little functional polymers. They're very amorphous. And they flow downstream into a dilute river. Or into worse, a dilute lacustrine or lake environment full of dissolved minerals and just really tough. So most of the time these things are just dying but they're being continuously fed new populations of protocell masses, new progenotes. And they could even be dried down and blown by wind, which is an active way that bacterial uh, films distribute today. They're blown by wind, miles. They eventually hit uh, these tough environments where they have to, by the time they're here, they have to be eating sunlight somehow. There's not enough chemicals to feed this prototypical living world, so they're capturing. They've got photosynthesis going by that point. This is where we put the transition from to life. So here's the proto progenote, and here is a progenote community with two protocell, a, a protocell that learned the trick of dividing itself. Now think about that. That's going to be the greatest thought experiment in biology and chemistry in the 21st century. If we have an operating system now that can boot up the functions of biology, how on earth do you get to a, a protocell that does a division and passes its genetic information to the daughter cells? Whoa, the machinery that is needed to do that is, is mind-boggling. This is what the creationists call irreducible complexity. However, it's possible within a network effect of sharing of products and constant movement and constant selection, constant complexity. It's an OS boot up issue. But when you get the dividing cell, you now have vertical descent. You can now pass your, your traits down and you don't have to dry down every time to make the next generation of polymers. You can make them in situ and pass them on and you have a transitionary phase in the late, what we call a late progenian, which is into the, wor the living world. And you have things, something called speciations possible, specialization. We predict two things, I'll say it here, that it was the energy collecting protocells that did this trick first. They just had the access to the most resources. The second prediction is that cellular division was an accident, just as everything in evolution seems to be. It was the accidental combination of two things, 
One would have been the replication of genetic material with trash collection. Because one of the most immense problems in the progenian epoch is the building up of toxins. You've got all these reactions happening with no active pores to push out byproducts and keep the, the cell clean. So you have jamming going on all the time. But if you have a pinching down mechanism that simply pinches down the end of your protocell and pushes the garbagey part away, you have a mechanism to have a viable protocell in the future. Well, what if this pinching down mechanism, which is a lot simpler than an active pore, is coupled to one day a protocell saying, well, I've just finished, you know, we've just templated and replicated a genetic material and we push it to either side and we pinch down. That's cell division. Accident, right? But what an amazing accident it was. It led to this. <laughs> Everything, right? So that's a prediction. So adaptation happens of these increasingly robust communities. They hit the an, an estuary, which has salt water infusion. Now they have to have active membrane management. They have to get that salt out of their cells or they just blow up the system. And then you get to colonization. So you get basically seashore marine adaptation to 10 meter tides and storms and uh, high salinity at the seashore and you get the stromatolites that we see for three billion years in the fossil record. So you have now global colonization and this follows our rock record of geyserite, here's a lacustrine stromatolite, here's a marine stromatolite, bigger and beefier a little bit later. So this is the grand synthesis of the entire thing. So this was featured in, on the cover of uh, National, um, National Geographic, Scientific American in August. We bumped, we bumped the eclipse off the cover. So Martin asked them, like, why on earth did, you know, we bump the eclipse off the cover? She said, I'm a microbiologist, the editor. And, and she, you're right. So she must have got some heat for that. But she also said, this may be the most important story we publish for decades because she really felt that, that there was something, there was legs on this thing. So that what they did was they adapted my drawing. This is how Scientific American did it for the public. We realized we had sort of one shot at this. And what they did was this wonderful, this is their wet drying depiction. So here's wet and the protocells forming and then dry, there's a film. So it starts from the simple and it rotates around here. You get more protocells and then you get the sludge forming, the gel. And you go around another round, you get more stable protocells, a bigger sludge, down up to the progenote, which is then the distributed entity. So they did a wonderful job with this spiral. So jumping a little bit forward, uh, I'm on a, one of the landing site selection teams for Mars 2020, which is a Curiosity's next generation going to Mars in 2020, landing in 2021. And there are three candidate sites left. One of them is Columbia Hills, which if you follow the space program, that's where the Spirit rover kind of ran out of gas. It was actually dragging its wheel. Uh, by the way, this is what we're looking for. What if we found stromatolites on Mars, right? It would be very strongly suggestive that there had been past life on Mars and it might lift, live in the deep biosphere, in the, in the hot rock biosphere, because it certainly can't live on the surface. So what we're looking for is these veins. And notice all the red here. It's the same sort of iron oxides that you find all over Mars. We're looking for something like this. This is the actual geyserite that's in the Scientific American article. If you, if you thin slice that, you see the, the banding. So this is where, uh, this is spirit dragging its wheel. The wheel stopped turning, the rear wheel, and look what it turned up. That's not snow, those are silica. That's the same stuff you find in Yellowstone. That's opaline silica. So. This entire area and the outcrops in the background were interpreted as being a 3.7 billion year old Yellowstone. What better a place to go and break rock and look for stromatolites? These are places that life is preserved. So on the surface of, on the surface at Columbia Hills are these rocks here, which look just like the digitate structures you find all over El Tatio in Chile. It looks just like active uh, hot spring deposits in on Earth influenced by biology. So our team is down to one of three teams left. We have six to eight months to make our case. I woke up one morning in March thinking, we can't break rocks. 
there's no tool in the carousel to chip rocks. So I went to Honeybee Robotics and we designed a, a spring chisel thing on paper that would, could be, fit in the carousel to break rocks. Because if I went to the field as a field geologist and forgot my rock hammer, they'd send me home, right? But now I have to get it on the cra on the vehicle. We have to convince them to go to here and back to here where they've already been, which geologists hate because they want to go collect new samples. But this is a life detection mission. It's our only shot as a species to detect the evidence, direct evidence for life on another world. This is our sole shot because there's no funded missions after this. It's done. Elon's probably never going to get there. You know, and then he's going to contaminate everything if he does driving his roadster on Mars, you know. So it'll be the end of the story. But this is it. So if anybody is a mechanical engineer in the audience and wants a fun project, all we need is to do is to compress a spring up a camshaft and throw a, a chisel bit down a tube. Then I can demonstrate it on that, that. Who's got the rock now? I can demonstrate it on that rock at NASA headquarters and show them how we could expose uh, stromatolite on Mars. So... Let's jump forward even further, because someone earlier asked about uh, sort of cosmology or life in the universe. Well, Kepler, what Kepler has found, if you've been following that amazing mission, is that there's a huge number of solar systems. They're tiny solar systems. They're around red dwarfs and brown dwarfs. And they found the Trappist system last year. It was published, I think, six Earth-sized planets within an orbit less than, than the orbit of Mercury, ridiculously tiny solar systems, but they're potentially candidates for life, much, much lower energy flux from their star. So this is sort of an artist's conception of a, of a different environment, which is sort of a, a moon uh, around a, a semi-hot uh, gas giant. But here may be sort of a Trappist type. You know, you've got your red sun, et cetera, et cetera you know, life there, I, I doubt whether it would be big plants like this because there's just not enough energy. Maybe they don't go beyond stromatolites. They don't go beyond simple microbial communities. But here is my claim or my prediction. Life requires polymers with encapsulation. If you can't show a chemistry, like chemistry on Titan, they can't show it at the cryogenic temperature. If you can't make polymers, you can't encode information, and you can't make function, you can't make tools, period. End of story. Can't do it with crystals. Can't do it with exotic things. If you can't encapsulate sets of polymers in little compartments that they can react and be selected for, you can't get to cellular life. Propose an alternative to cellular life, and we'll look at that. But so that any of these exoplanets has to have liquid water at these temperatures and the ability to encapsulate to make polymers non-enzymatically and encapsulate them. So it's probably got to be aqueous carbon-based chemistry, not exotic chemistries. Although that's just all sci-fi, you know, when you get down to the hard nuts of it. So I thought to myself, well, I was doing this talk, and sorry for going through the white screen, suddenly wake you up three quarters of the way through. I, th I was doing a talk like this to another audience about a year ago, and somebody put their hand up and said, aren't you on the threshold of a second Copernican revolution? You know, I knew a little bit about astronomy, but not a lot. And I thought, well, what does this have to do with that? He said, because if you have discovered the mechanism that takes us from physics to biology, isn't that some kind of a new, new center? Isn't that kind of a recentering of a bunch of different fields? So I started sort of thinking about this. And Copernicus, as you know, the Polish astronomer that you know, did his observations and did his math and centered the solar system around the sun, the heliocentric universe. He published his results after his death, so he didn't lose his funding or his head. The, those results sort of didn't raise the ire of the Catholic Church or the authorities for 70 years until Galileo got hold of it, and then he did lose almost, he lost his funding and almost his head. But here's Kepler's result, the heliocentric universe. And this was a major threat to the powers that be for some reason, you know, why the Earth was not the center of the universe. Hello, you know. And it started humanity's move away and seeing ourselves as part of a bigger thing rather than being the only thing. That's a big philosophical shift. So I started to look at this, and then I had thought experiment number five, which is kind of the most trippy thought experiment yet. I put my, my little... Uh, 
54, 55-year-old monkey brain at this boundary, physics to biology, what happened here? What happened? Now that we have a system in the lab that works, that we can actually observe minute by minute, that we think is the, is the boundary, the gap crosser, the gap crossing mechanism. And I had a dream one night, and I said to the dream, was it necessary to have a guy with a long beard and spectacles and a lot of chemical equipment and patients there at the origin of life basically saying, uh, move that carbon atom five angstroms to the left? And the dream said to me, no, the, the dream was snarky. You know, it said, no, that's an unnecessary complication. Let me show you how you were made. So it brought up this undulating plane and, and told me to push down on the plane. So I pushed down on the plane here and it moved. Like, and it said, you see, it's pre-statable. You push there, you're gonna, you know what you're getting over there. I guess this is more classical, but, uh, then it brought up <clears throat> this little guy in the plane, it looked like almost like a divot in a golf course. And I, I looked into it very closely and I saw, oh, it's a, it's a compartment. It's a membranous compartment of some sort. Of course, I'm thinking about protocells all day, so of course what I'm going to see is a protocell. And I looked closely at it, and then a, a polymer went into the compartment, and now it's jostling together with the other things, and, and a reaction happens. And then the system said, what do you see? I said, well, um, I'm almost seeing a system that makes things more probable than before. Because if you have a compartment that allows things in, it makes the reactions more probable. Like here you're sitting in this room, you're more likely to meet somebody that could help with your tech startup or your art project, whatnot, because we're crowded together. That's the basis of biology, crowding together. It's a probability tweaking engine system, crowd together. It's sort of just physical, you know. And then it brought up a second view. It brought up a second protocell, and I noticed the dip between them as the membrane sort of collided with each other, I noticed a lot of transmembrane movement across that, more than I would have thought. And so I asked the dream, I said, well, what's that? And it said, that's the interconnection system, and it's deeper than you, pre you, should, you should suppose, or you are supposing. So then it brought up more protocells, and I saw that, oh, it's a three-dimensional network of sharing. And the dream said, that's message passing. Go find where that is in physics and, and report back to me. Physics is crappy at message passing. And then it gave me a whole soliloquy about the unproductivity of the universe, saying the frustration that with the universe that in 13 billion years all it's produced is a bunch of more stars and heavier elements. It's super unproductive in generating complexity, but not until it gets to this system. So then the next thing was shown. This, this particular dream was a real fan of, of Descartes because he brought up three Cartesian plots. He showed a larger protocellular mass, he or she or it, probably was a she, and showed me three Cartesian plots, this P, this I, and I realized, oh, that's, pro that's probability. So this mass is a machine capable of increasing events from improbable and making them actual at an increasing rate. And then it also is an interconnection machine, even if it's just diffusing of molecular products, it's a message passing machine which also has a nonlinear behavior. And this is not a living system. This is, this is a physical system. And then it asked me, what's here? What's the third plot? And I said, ah, uh, some kind of a memory? He said, bingo. Once you get this going, you can create this. You can start writing memories. And I realized, oh yeah, because you'll write that first little template, that first little piece of genetic material it's a memory. And then just as I was having that thought, it brought this system up and said, okay, let's watch this work as a unit. You have a probability engine that you've identified. You have an interconnection system, which then generates your memory for the next generation, makes things that are less probable even more probable, which generates more connections, which generates more memory, which goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. And this is what made you. And this is what we're calling the progenote. So probability, interconnection, memory. Probability going around and around and around. And I, I actually was at the Science of Consciousness conference in June, and I said to the audience, because 
they're trying to study consciousness, which is a system that's is way too big and complex to study, right? It's just too huge. And I said, well, the only way to study really consciousness is to wind life down to the beginning and find out its boot up properties and then extrapolate forward. And I challenge them, find anything that's not explainable by the interaction of these three systems plus physics. No one's no one raised their hand yet. This is this explains everything. Technology, biology, human social interaction, book publishing. You can break you can break anything down into this uh, interaction of these three systems. So I started looking at this and realized, okay, this is, can boot chemistry. This can boot chemistry from pure physics into into biology. This affects our understanding of evolutionary biology. We can look at the lens of life through through this generative engine and, and rethink it. It affects geology, because if life got started on land and operated this way, it, it changed the geological history of the Earth or Mars, where we will find life in the universe. Cycling systems that encapsulate, that can write, do interconnection and message passing and make memories. It'll show us where life can be in the universe. It rolls down into physics because it's a system that shows uh, for physics to write information and read it, even before it's biology. It's a system that allows the physics of the cosmos to go from a two-cycling binary state to a three-cycling trinary state with biology and memory in the middle. And finally, the universe goes from this boring thing that's unproductive to create massive complexity rapidly. So it also rolls into complexity theory and AI. Because right now, when... Remember when I had that vision that computers were really stupid when they arrived in our town? They're still stupid, right? They're still linear pipes. They're like an hourglass with sand grains going down through the pipes, and they break all the time. You know, at the conference I was at, the sand conference, they had Sophia, the AI there, and she fried. I mean, she started smoking and just died on stage, right? There's something wrong with, you know, assuming singularities are going to occur and then suddenly a log file gets filled and the entire network goes down, right? Biology doesn't die when log files get filled. So our entire technological framework is built on crap, right? It's built on these processes and services and things that have to be constantly hand-tweaked. So if we think of a singularity ever happening or intelligence arising in that system, we are nuts, right? We, we are nuts. It's like when we think in the 1930s that transistor-based or radio-based or piston earlier piston systems could create a man, you know, out of pistons. We just laugh at those people, they're going to be laughing at us. Why? Because the way that com computational systems are, are built is super fragile, and they're not at all like natural systems, which are massively parallel, stochastic, and, and they're based on massive random process as their base. And so, we, but we could reboot AI by building a system like this, that would be capable of open-ended emergence and learning on that on those principles we could create true learning ais out of this new new architecture we could see our economy differently through this lens it's all about interconnects it's all about community functions it's all about sharing and it's all about lifting of innovation and memory to the next level changing our political economy you know people who create separation uh, politicians that create division and conflict go against the grain of the natural system, the natural world itself, which is if we had a communal symbiotic start, we're still a communal symbiotic planet and a species. Our bodies are this way, our cities are this way. Get a clue. So in a way, this is hardcore reductionist science rolling its way through, it's going to roll through everything. Political economy, social Darwinism, a construct of the 20th century. Millions of people died on the on the sword of social Darwinism, survival of the fittest, right? It was not a good, good meme, and Charles Darwin didn't like it. He, he thought it was 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 it was a very Victorian idea of superiority, right? We can roll survival of the fittest completely out of our language. It'd be very very uh, useful for our survival. So this is where philosophy and metaphysics comes in. It's all about the communal uh, operation. It's all about network effects. It's all about relationship and interaction. If that's how life began and how life still rolls, we can't think of ourselves as individuals in this game. We're not. We're probably the only species that has enough neurons to convince ourselves of the illusion of our separateness, you know, which is what Ram Dass keeps telling us from, you know, from uh, to, to be here now, right? 
And so this impacts spiritual inquiry, right? The whole Judeo-Christian framework, you know, ought to come crashing down by now. I mean, there's certainly enough counter evidence against it, and new frameworks come up. This could help roll that that framework to a much more sustainable, healthy uh, world. So is this thing, is this three-way cycling the actual engine of creation that created everything, that created the environment that we're in now? It could well be. It's testable. So with that, I want to finish up this talk with another engine of creation that Dave and I have put together, Dave Deemer at UCSC, which is a new institute because what we realized a few years back was if we're finding a new way to do chemistry away from equilibrium chemistry and cycle systems, any fundamental science, any pure fundamental science always generates a plethora of startups, right? This is why I'm here in, in IndieBio. This is the first time this has been ever presented outside of, you know, hard hard head chemists community. This is the first time this has been presented to the entrepreneurial community. So we formed the Biota Institute, Biota, which means uh, life in Greek, for two functions, to fund the research on the origin of life, but also to, f to create a new venture incubator or, or partner with an existing incubator. And we already have one spin out. This is Dave's work from the 1980s it spun out into a company called Oxford Nanopore in, in 2005. And this is the, the Nature Biotechnology cover of Dave's invention of the nanopore sequencing mechanism. And it created the MinION, which is a device they use right here. And it's a tremendous example of origin of life research, fundamental research, creating an incredible new technology. So instead of a half million dollar uh, Luma device, you have this. It doesn't quite do what the Illumina device does, but you can attach this to a laptop and do sequencing. So uh, the Ebola outbreak in Africa two years ago was done with the Minion. So this is, this is the device. It's like smaller than a cigarette pack. And you can do gigabases of DNA sequences and RNA sequences through this device. You still need to do manual preparations, but it's a huge leap. It's the actual connection between the digital world and the genetic world, the direct connection. We don't have to actually break up and do PCR on the on the on what we're trying to sequence. It just goes straight through. And its valuation today is two billion. So here's a, a spin-off we're doing right now. Uh, we formed last month, and the patents were filed last month on on campus. So this is the original patent for lipid-mediated nucleic acid synthesis. So the the synthesis of which you just saw, the nucleic acids without an enzyme. Because if you want to produce a whole bunch of short RNAs, you've got to do an expensive and low-yielding enzymatic process. So this is, this is the, the claim 19 in the patent, which is the base, basis of this. And what we're doing was Dave figured out, well, we can make siRNAs. And siRNAs are these small interfering RNAs that can be introduced into a cell that can then interfere with, say, for instance, viral, viral RNA that's trying to use ribosomes in the cell to make copies of itself. And we can target uh, those, those viral RNAs, and we can silence them. It's very, very selective. This is from this wonderful uh, Nature Biotech movie, of, if you're really interested in siRNAs, of, of the argonaut uh, molecule grabbing grabbing hold with this single strand of, say, 21 mer siRNA going to the mRNA and getting ready to silence it or break it up or interfere, interfere with the ribosome making, making the protein. So this is, this is the action that happens in the cell with siRNAs. So with this wet-dry cycling, we believe we can build a system that can produce siRNAs on demand with a template in huge volumes at virtually no cost. So instead of waiting for your small sample to come, we can just continually make it in stream, just volume trillion upon trillion tr trillion oligomers just over and over and over again. So that could be a revolution in biotech. Bulk production of short oligo RNA. And the patents were filed, the new patents were filed last month. This is my favorite. This is from my PhD work of 10 years ago. 
uh, what I did for that work was was crazy. I started this work in 1985 and realized, well, I have an ARPANET account and I have a VAX 11750 and I have a, a, a Tektronix graphics display. I should be able to solve the mystery of the origin of life in 1985, you know. And we had Back to the Future and, you know, if you had the dock and you had a flux capacitor and you could travel through time, surely, you know, this computing hardware we have can get, un unveil nature's greatest mystery and know it wasn't to be. There was no field, there were no tools, there were no libraries, there was no internet. It was just, well, we had Usenet and FTP. But I said, uh-oh, I'm 25 years too late or too early. I have to wait 20 to 25 years to restart this work. So I stopped my PhD I held four conferences on this theme with Richard Dawkins and others in the 90s to, to get the social network built up. And then I restarted in 2005, six. Said, okay, we have the tools. And I had been doing 15 years of work for NASA and I had a whole developer team doing mission simulation and design and asteroid capture and resource utilization and stuff. And that's a whole other talk. Uh, if you have a spare billion, talk to me later. Uh, but I said to myself, okay, I'm ready to do the PhD. I'm ready to go back to it, which was to simulate huge volumes of randomly bouncing around atoms to see how many bonds would form. And this is real chemical simulation rather than saying, well, we'll just do a procedure that does that. No, no, you have to wait until these probabilistic events happen. So we built and ran this at UC San Diego, and we built a, a Java interface to show us in this cloud when bonds were forming through time. And the way it worked was we would start 10,000 small volumes, run the Gromax molecular dynamics engine on all of them. If bonds formed, we would flush the system out and restart with the same conditions. 10,000 more volumes and flush the system out. And this was a basically an accelerator for bond formation that was three orders of magnitude better than sort of a linear simulation. And that's what PhD examiners want to see, so I got the PhD. But what we showed was that stochastic hill climbing accelerates bond events. And what stochastic hill climbing is, it's a very nerdy term, but if you're climbing up a little mountain in a noisy space, and you're in the Himalayas, you climb up the hill, and you want to get up to Mount Everest, the only way you can get to Everest, you can sit on your hill like a monk, and look at Everest and say, I want to get to Everest. Or you can start wandering again, wander off that hill, find a ridge that takes you to a taller hill. If you go back down to the valley you came from, you just lost all your energy and you have to climb an identical hill again. But if you find a ridge, you can get to a higher mountain and then higher. And this is how mountain climbers work. It's stochastic hill climbing. They have to be willing to give up their little local achievement wobble down and go up to the next. And this is how Darwin's finches evolved on the Galapagos Islands where I just I was just there. And this is how all of biology works and how all of technology and markets and everything, they use stochastic hill climbing. And so if you could build a machine that would do this in chemistry, you have an architecture for a chemical search engine. And this is our first attempt at it. This was used in our origin of life res uh, research. You saw that in the lab. This is the sort of vision for, the sort of cartoon vision of starting a lot of experiments, doing real-time analysis and feeding back and flushing out the experimental apparatus, combining the results of experiments and just doing more batteries. So this, this would be the Genesis engine. This would be the chemical accelerator. And you could set up all kinds of circuits here. You could say, put a catalyst in here, RNA there, vesicles there, make your soup, react it. As, as long as you do real-time like the minion, like nanopore sequencing, real time, real time scoring, you can then go back and start over again. And you can build these enormous chemical circuits. So this would be kind of done in microfluidics or through nanodrop chemistry. And the idea would be to build the world's first chemical search engine. So our, our neighbor in New Jersey, who's the head of painkiller research at, at Glaxo, I showed this to him about five years ago. He says, I don't care about, he's British, I don't care about your origin of life problem. That's the hardest problem. But I, what I do care about is the fact that a system like this could, you could dial in a pharmaceutical that you found worked in the lab and it would find the circuits and the catalysts through massive, basically brute force 
chemical simulation to find the best way to make that, that pharmaceutical in volume and reliably. And I said to him, well, what would Glaxo put into this? And he said, we would put a billion dollars to get this capability into such a system. So then us origin of, uh, impoverished origin of life researchers could get the hand down machines, right? That's the whole idea. But you could, you could do other things with it. You could find catalysts. You could introduce membranes and, and f figure out the membrane polymer interaction. So this would be used in drug discovery, testing, and manufacturing, both on all three, all three phases. So with that, you know, if you have a spare billion, uh, <laughs> we can talk. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your, your time and leave some time for questions. Uh, these are our collaborators uh, and supporters over the years. I just want to put a, a shout out for McMaster University in Canada. Uh, they are coming online in, so, so this origin of life wet dry cycling pools thing has spread all over the, the world in our field. It's being done in six or seven groups now because they can get products out of it. But McMaster went even further. They built this one square foot chamber that cost about a half million dollars and they're gonna make it a simulation of the Hadean Earth. So it's gonna have the humidity, the ultraviolet flux, the gas composition of their atmosphere. We're gonna be putting basalt surfaces in there just like a volcanic island. And when we're ready, we're gonna grind up a little powder of those 4.5 billion year old carbonaceous chondrites we have and sprinkling it inside the chamber, no, not with our fingers, <laughs> uh, down onto the basalt surface and then, then fluctuating wet dry cycling, probably with just mist, just a dew cycling. And if we can make polymers, we can make membranous structures, which we surely will. If we can grow polymers in that condition, it'll be the Miller-Urey experiment of the 21st century. You know, complex and, hey, we got some peptides. We, we certainly won't get nucleic acids because we even activated them. You know, we, they're, they're nuclear bases. But if we can get some peptides in, in membranous compartments, that's really strongly suggestive. So that's happening in June. They're going to inaugurate that new simulation chamber. And uh, just the other colleagues, NASA supplied a lot of resources, Harry Lonsdale. These are the colleagues in Paris. Uh, these are our, our, our colleagues in Australia, uh, University of New South Wales. And these are the colleagues that did a lot of the peptide work, Center for Chemical Evolution in Georgia Tech and the Cronin Lab. And if you want to reach me, this site is not up yet, biota.org. It's my old original conference site. But feel free to reach out uh, uh, oh. <laughs> Reach out at any time. But thank you for your, your attention. Yeah. Um, does anybody have a question for Bruce? Oh. Uh, what are the um, what are the required or, or optimal temperature boundaries for the processes that you're probably going to think about? Like yeah. I can do that. Yeah. Question. What are the optimal or, or, or requisite or optimal temperature boundaries for the processes you're describing? This is an extremely good question, and it's puzzling and troubling to some degree for us. What are the optimal temperature regimes? Well, it turns out that we you can actually track this in the lab. If we're below uh, 60 C, we're not going to get, uh, and, and if, we're, if we're higher in pH, we actually have to be in an acidic environment at middle temperatures, not hot, not 100 C plus. We can, we can polymerize up to 90 C in that range, 60 to 70 to 90 C with an acidic pH because then we proten, protonate everything. It just happens. So the question is, is this the box that we have to work with to make these polymers? And is this a sufficient box? And in a cooler environment, we just simply wouldn't get these products. And in a more uh, alkaline environment, we wouldn't get the products. So it's, it's nature sort of throwing a little curveball at us like, you got to get through this this set of things. So this is I'm going to New Zealand in June to go to the Rotorua, actually to Maori Maori owned tribal lands where they have tremendous range of pH and temperature, and we're going to try the experiments there. 
And because it's not a national park, we're allowed to put our reagents directly. This is why we could do it in Kamchatka. If it's not a national park, somebody could throw a cigarette butt in there. But as scientists, we can't introduce simple compounds into those pools. But the Maori elder who is inviting us to this location said, Hey, man, we used to cook pigs in our, those pools. You can put anything you want in there. So that, that's the long answer to the short question. Question here? Um, so you since the process kind of continues, so have you ever found like new species of new species of process in general right now? Like you know, like you see this whole process of um, you know, starting from uh, the simple it was all the way to, to like This is another extremely good question. So here's Here's the, the question is, why don't we, do we see this in the natural environment? Do we see protocell populations spontaneously forming in somewhere like Yellowstone and cycling? We don't. And actually, in the second part of Darwin's letter to Hooker, he writes the answer. Basically, we don't see it again because new current life consumes it. And there's something that he didn't understand, which is oxygen is a problem. If you have oxygen in the environment, it, it jams up all the, the reactions we're doing. We have to do them mostly in an un unoxic environment. So life actually prevents a second genesis in a way because it's going to eat that material. That material's it's doomed. I mean, if we make progenotes in the lab in the 21st century, we'll know it when we see the, the masses in time lapse growing and shrinking and crashing and growing and shrinking in the dishes. And then we pipette that and we, we sequence and we find there's a polymer that has adapted to a stress. But people shouldn't be worried that if we flush it down the sink, it's going to eat the planet because it'll just get absolutely destroyed by biology today and it will stop working outside of a laboratory. So if we do that second genesis, if we actually see our, our ancestry, our, our plausible ancestry, we, it will not be the blob, you know, unfortunately. <laughs> be very fragile. Yeah. Question here. So uh, my dad talked to me about when I was a kid talking about organic chemistry <coughs> and how carbon is part of life and what, how it's unique about organic uh, bonds versus, you know, hydrostatic bonds. Uh, how does everything so false so easy in the periodic table, if you believe that? And second is if there's if they be silicon-based life forms because they're actually in the part. I think the, I'm, it's not my specialty, but there's a brilliant paper. I think it came out of Jack, uh, not Jack Shostak, but Seth Shostak, <laughs> the alien hunter. That uh, well, here's here's a really creative answer for you. If you were a, a biologist, an or, or origin of life biologist, and you had a buddy who was a geologist, but you had a a, a crazy Silicon Valley you know, psycho nerd, psychonaut who is able to create a time portal. So they open up the time portal for you guys and you go through it, you're using your oxygen suits, you go back to the earth at 4.3 billion years and you look for these pools and you find the sludge in the bottom of the pools. And then you, you, you come back, say, a million years after that and the sludge is sort of different somehow. Maybe it went black. Somehow it's a different color because it's using polycyclics and it's collecting energy. Well, the geologists would say, that's just mineral effusions. That's just sludge. If we can't break it with a rock hammer, we're not calling it geology. And the biologist says, that's your, you know, what is that? There's a sludge. It's not alive yet, but it's the boundary between those worlds. And now here's, here's a, the creative way of interpreting that is geology uses a crystal to grow. Silica, silicon and other other compounds, but it uses a hard crystal that forms a hard structure for the most part. Biology uses a soft liquid crystal called lipid, amphiphilic molecules that have these weird properties. In the in the branching from geology to biology, one goes to hard crystal, one goes to liquid crystal, and the liquid crystals through selection learn how to make their own solutes, so they grow indefinitely. Uh, and yet. If you knock right here, knocking on the, the door, you're knocking on wood here, you're walking, knocking on appetite. That's a mineral made by your cells. Appetite, it's still in, in nature and in geology, but our cells make it for our bones. We dig new mineral types. This is, a, this is phonite. This is a new mineral created by biology. Concreteite made make the Bay freaking Bay Bridge, you know. 
everything. I mean, there's polymerites everywhere, these chairs and everything. So we're still intimately connected, but the building blocks that they're using actually cannot go through natural selection and evolve. And the other answer, I think this was in Shostak's paper, was carbon is so common as a, as a, and it's so good as a building block for polymers, why wouldn't it be used everywhere? And it works well in the aqueous medium. So it's like the lowest hanging fruit. So it, it, it probably, geology can evolve through hard crystals just fine. And the planet, you know, our planet has like 20,000 types of minerals and Mars has like 600 because it doesn't have biology. So biology and geology are this co-evolving system, in a way. I have no clue. <laughs> That's for the question here. Yeah, um, two questions, hopefully. I'm fascinated about the notion of biosemiotics, that communication of meaning was co co-originated with um, the dynamics of life. I'd love to hear your point of view about that. I have another question. You are triad, generative triad, probability, intersection, and um, You use the term bond events. And certainly, we understand probability. It's sort of a lot of people in this community who think you know, the universe is deterministic. You know, so it alternates between random and determinism. Memory, and we, we understand structure and, and we can apply the sense of the oral program. But interconnection is, is the part of your talk that you know, I, I was not able to, to learn anything in that area in, in, in interconnection. So bond events specifically is a term that I'd love to hear you talk about. What is a bond event? Oh, in, in the abstract, <clears throat> a bond event is actually all three of those things. It's the or event because it's the probability of a bond forming. There's there's an interconnectedness now between two things that are creating properties that wouldn't have existed, can can express properties, and they stick together and they affect everything around them. So in a sense, the unwinding of the living world of the engine of creation goes down to that bond. And then that unwinding event goes to cosmogenesis. It goes all the way to the origin of the cosmos because if the cosmos was a fecund system that made trillions and trillions of subatomic particles as a, as a huge plasma, it wasn't until those things connected together to create properties, to create nuclei. And so in some sense, the bond is the thing. Uh, it, but it's the coalescence of, of all those properties. And the living world separates those properties out into distinct systems. Let me go back to the first question again. I would ask it somewhat differently about um, um, the consciousness going all the way down, that because of this generative cycle at these very low levels, I forget this, parasite is like this. Mm -hmm. So folks like Terry Deacon, um, basically say there has to be a minimal complexity and minimal structure in order to basically have a synthesis. Mm -hmm. and, a, and that, some people say, starts with life, um, to have that minimal complexity. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you think it goes all the way down. I'm, <clears throat> I'm definitely not a panpsychist, because I think panpsychism is a huge cop-out. Right, it's a huge denial of, of certainly of science, but also of inquiry itself, and a denial of life itself. So, for example, panpsychism is the idea that say every atom has some kind of consciousness. So the whole universe is effused with consciousness when there's of course no evidence for that. And what consciousness is is an emergent phenomenon. We know that from the way we grow up, we have baby learns and grows in the world. It's an emergent phenomenon. It has to run on an operating system. It has to run on a substrate, and the substrate is the living world. And if we look elsewhere for explanations, we are casting our energy and our, our attention to something that's really nonsense. This is no, no foundation. Instead, we look at the miracle of the living world, the complexity of the living world. So, for example, this 
three-way system of P and I and M going and going and going, what the, the last statement of the dream told me was usually these dreams grab me by the shirt collar at the end. So the dream grabbed my shirt collar because that's why I wear collared shirts when I have these dreams. So I can be grabbed by the dream. And it said, you listen and you listen good. You are only now sensing the size of this field, call it a field, that's made by the living world. It's made by the cycling of these processes. You're only now sensing it as a species with whatever you do, your meditations, your your you know, your psychedelics, your vipassanas, your massive bulletproof caffeine episodes, whatever it is, you're, you're, you're coming into a place where you go out of mental state and you start feeling with your entire body, all your chakras, if you will, your heart, your whole system, and you start connecting with the bigger field. And more and more of you are doing it. 5,000 years ago was a handful called the shamans who knew how to do this. Then there was a bunch of crackpot people who came in through religious channels that could do it, but then they got their stuff got branded and turned into McDonald's and the Catholic Church or whatever. But then in the 60s, right over here in the Haight-Ashbury, there, there was this eruption, you know, out of that colloquial, rigid mind structure that was made in the 1950s by, you know, the entire Industrial Revolution, the entire thing. It broke apart because our minds were broken apart by the psychedelic revolution, and we started seeing, and then we got started meditating, and East meets West, and Ram Dass went, got kicked out of Harvard, and you know the whole thing just unrolled, and it's still rolling now. But what it is, is like, wait a minute, there's more to the universe than what our rational minds can work out and what we can measure in the lab, right? So my entire flow of my entire life from when I was nine was assuming that there was a bigger field that could be connected to but I was much of a gearhead kid that I wanted it to deliver. I didn't want to create a new religion. I didn't want to create like flowery books about vision. I wanted something that worked, the gears meshed and it worked. And I wanted to ask that field, like, hey, if you're out there, guide me. Now, is it is it my neurons that are doing it? I didn't care. It always seemed to deliver over and over and over again. Visionary experience would always deliver. And then we could go back in the lab or into the field and, and test it out. So this field is huge, and we're just discovering it. So the 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 uh, entity that was running my dream grabs my shirt collar and says, just don't name this thing. Don't call a molehill Mount Everest. Just learn how to experience it. You are the greatest, most exquisitely evolved instruments to detect, to, to go into this field and sense it and learn it that has ever emerged on this planet, maybe in many planets. But don't shortchange yourself by thinking you know what it is. Go and experiment. Find ways to go into that field further and deeper and come back. Don't lose your centers. You know, don't fantasize. But ask it questions and be a participant. Have a dialogue. It's a huge resource. And I, I said to him, well, what is this field? What is the fundamental nature of this field? And it came back to me knocking on my bone head and saying, Dumkoff, what did I show you in the three-way cycle? What was the first thing I showed you? Probability. The field it rolls or it exists as a machine to take improbable things, highly improbable things, into actuality. Your religion calls them miracles. Your philosophical bent might call it synchronicities. And what an amazing thing happened in my life. Or I didn't, you know, I drove down the 101 and didn't run into anybody. So life as, an, as a feel, as a system, is exquisitely adapted to making miracles happen. But they're not miracles in miracle term. They're, this is how it works. And, and the human beings have taken technology, you know, tools and memory. We invented language and, and books and things like that, and now the Internet. <clears throat> and we have a crowding mechanism called cyberspace, and we put 7 billion of us on the planet to get even more crowded, Right. We, we are a probability machine. We are a miracle-creating machine built into the living world, right? And we are on an incredible trajectory. And we're on probably a very rare trajectory for our sentient life in the universe, extremely rare instance. There isn't, I, I put it forth to you, there is no other example of this, not even close. 
There may be a slow-growing Entmoot, you know, tree-based civilization that's always basically saying it's going to take a long time, right? There may be those ones, but we're the hot-headed, hot-blooded monkeys, you know, that are half crazy, and we're just driving this complexity thing. We're driving probability so damn hard, right? It's an amazing thing. We are, we are the miracle that we've been looking for, you know, but we also can tip over the edge and, and blow the whole thing up, as we almost did in 1990 with the collapse of the Cold War. You know, and we could do it again if we don't deal with the psychopaths, electing psychopaths to leadership positions. In finance, too, I have to point out, don't mention it uh, too loudly. But we, we, we have to get, we have to understand ourselves incredibly deeply. We have to understand our roots of our traumas and what drive us in our lives, heal our, our primate, primordial, hominid system, and then realize what an incredible gift we've been given, that we're living in a miracle machine that's bigger than us. It's bigger than one person's mental feel. And what I believe, and this is a, where I'll leave you, is this is the most powerful tool humans will ever have, the power of intention and paying attention. So if you say, hey, I want to become an amazing dancer, you know, and you're at a certain age where maybe you're 50, you could still become an amazing dancer. And you have that intention, you dream one night, where you have an awaking, lucid dream of you being a dancer on stage, doing something. And then the universe is going to start, it sets up a, a valley of, of probability ahead of you and rolls little marbles down into that valley. Like, hey, someone just mentioned a dance class by someone who's really well known that works with your body type. Go to the class, <laughs> right? You go to that class, you learn 10 other things that Go to that tryout. Go to that improv dancing. Go to and if you follow all those steps, and and when you look back at it, you think that's totally improbable that I'm now and you're not at Carnegie Hall if you're 50, but uh, I am now doing my dream, and it took only two years, when maybe it would have taken 20 years for somebody before that. Because why? We're an accelerated probability machine, and that's what this place is about. This incubator is about. $250,000 gets you a desk downstairs and access to this lab. Now I sound like I'm selling the, but it allows you to bring an improbable thing like a new food stuff for bees that can allow them to pollinate faster against this degradation of bee populations. And in, in four months, with $250,000 and access to the lab and a network of people and VC and everything, by God, there's like a new bee food that can be sprayed on crops or put into the hives, then the bees can can pollinate almond crops so we don't lose the almond crop because of the, the viruses. Think about that. I mean, and that's quick, right? In, in three or four or five months, they, they have proven something that they can get the 10 or 20 million that they need to productize it, and suddenly we stayed ahead of the degradation of the loss of our entire almond crop and maybe our other food stuffs. So we're living in a mag magical probability machine. And what disturbs the machine is the concept of separateness. So fake news, divisive things, people go to violence, they go to separate, they go to loneliness, they go to depression, right? That's the disturbance in the field of probability. You can't have a dream and, and realize it if you keep getting derailed by the crazy noise in the system or by your own self-doubts. People who realize dreams really kind of keep it, keep a dream alive. They keep belief in it, and they keep that door opening. They keep that probability tweaking. It may take decades, but I think that's the that's the greatest tool we have as a species: is understanding we're living in a probability machine that we we have some volition over. We can shape it like, like Play-Doh. It's a field that we can shape like Play-Doh, and we can go through the little valleys, and we'll meet the right people and at the right times, and we can trust the system. We can really trust it. Combinatorially, it's got us beat. It can deliver pretty much anything. But only if we have faith, and this is what I mean by true faith, you know, not faith in an art, of, in a, you know, fantasized ob objective God or something. Faith in every moment. I think with that, I, we're probably over time, but I want to. That's perfect. What a great ending. Thank you so much, Bruce.
Um, for everybody who wants to hang out with Bruce, we're going to actually head off to dinner. Um, I'm sure we'll have some space, not for everybody, but he'll, he'll be here for a few minutes and we'll start walking over at the, it's called uh, Trapiseño. Hopefully I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, we'll be Trapiseño. Thank you so much. Uh, very nearby. It's just a five, ten minute walk. Um, I would like to thank, before we end, I would like to thank uh, June from Indie Bio for letting us host here. Uh, and also, I'd like to have the entire Conscious Biotechers team at, come up here on stage that pulled off this whole event together. Uh, Tiffany, who is our communication director. And uh, we have obviously met Chris, who is our in-house <laughs> meditation expert. <laughs> and then Alex, if you haven't met Alex yet, he is uh, part of our group. He's, uh, he's got his own startup. He is uh, a biotech CEO, uh, Mantra Bio. And actually, our next talk is going to be about um, how to bring in awareness, mindfulness practice to startups, you know, uh, how you use that in your own company. And we'll have a VC control, VC uh, venture capitalist also who implements these tools. And so thank you guys for coming up and, um, yeah, let's connect. And if you guys would like to volunteer or do any kind of contribution, find speakers, please come and let us know. Oh yeah. One more thing. <laughs> one, one little plug. Um, all of our uh, new events are going to be released on Facebook first. So uh, like our page to see what's coming up next. Um, we'll have early release tickets there for some uh, complimentary tickets. So uh, hopefully uh, we can all pull out our little mobiles and uh, like like conscious biotechers. We're so grateful that you guys came. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for the beautiful leadership and uh, this new space ahead. We are all so glad that you guys could join us tonight. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.